I am very excited to be the ranking member of the Budget Committee and look forward to working with Chairman Mike Enzi, somebody I've known for many years, uh, to work in those areas where we can come up with um, uh, agreement. Uh, let me begin by saying that a budget, whether it is a family budget or the budget of the United States of America, is about priorities. And when we do the budget of the United States, it is imperative that we take a hard look at the problems facing our country, what in fact is going on in our country, and how we can best address the problems. Within that context, I must say that the budget passed last year by the Republican House, the so-called Ryan budget, which called for massive cuts in Medicare, ending Medicare as we know it, massive cuts in Medicaid, education, nutrition, affordable housing, and many other programs impacting the lives of working Americans, while at the same time providing huge tax breaks for the wealthy and large corporations, is a budget approach which moves us in exactly the wrong direction. And needless to say, if the Republicans bring up a budget based on the same principles that the Ryan budget was based on, I will do everything I can to oppose that effort. When we look at a budget, when we prepare a budget, it's imperative that we take a hard look at the reality of American life and that we build based on that reality. And here, briefly, to my mind, is what reality in America today is about. While the economy in the last six years has made significant gains, the simple truth is that the American middle class has been declining over the last 40 years. And I think most American workers understand that. Today, at a time when the wealthy and large corporations are doing phenomenally well. Median family income is nearly $5,000 less than it was in 1999. The median male worker, that male worker right in the middle of the economy, half above, half below, unbelievably, in inflation accounted for dollars, made $783 less last year than he did 41 years ago. The median female worker, that woman right in the middle of the economy, made $1,337 less last year than she did in 2007. In terms of unemployment, real unemployment, including those people who have given up looking for work and those people who are working part-time when they want to work full-time, it is not 5.6%. It is 11.2 percent. Youth unemployment is 16.8 percent. African American youth unemployment is over 30 percent. And everybody knows, whether it is Vermont, California, or anyplace else, that we have millions of people today who are working longer hours for lower wages despite an explosion in technology and productivity. And meanwhile, in the midst of this collapsing middle class, the people on top are doing extraordinarily well, and large corporations are enjoying record-breaking profits. So when you look at a budget, it is imperative that you look at the overarching reality of American life. And today, when we look at America, we have to understand that we have an obscene level of income and wealth inequality the highest of any major country on earth, and worse in America today than at any time since 1929. Today, the top one-tenth of one percent, one-tenth of one percent, own nearly as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. One-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. One family, the Walton family of Walmart, owns more wealth than the bottom 40 percent. In terms of income, the latest figures that I have seen is that since the Wall Street crash, 
95% of all new income goes to the top 1%. That is where we are as a nation. And when we prepare a budget, those are the realities, in my view, that we should be looking at. Further, in terms of senior citizens, what we know today is that the elderly poverty rate has gone up to 9.5%. And incredible as it may sound, 20% of seniors live on, our, live on an average income of $7,600 a year. I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you, how anybody lives on $7,600 a year, but we have 20% of seniors who live at that level. At a time when the average Social Security benefit is less than $1,300 a month, one-third of the seniors living in this country depend on Social Security for almost all of their income, $1,300 a month. In fact, two-thirds of seniors rely on Social Security for more than half of their income. So this is where we are today. Middle class declining, millions of seniors struggling to pay their food, their medicine, and their heat. And what, what do the Republicans do in the House of Representatives on their very first day of the new session? What do they do? On that very first day, the Republicans in the House made a change in its rules that could lead to a 20% cut in Social Security disability benefits for 11 million Americans, including 2 million children, over a million veterans, and over 150,000 surviving spouses. In other words, in the midst of massive wealth and income inequality, the Republicans on their very first day of the new session want to make massive cuts in a program that benefits some of the most vulnerable people in this country, people with disabilities. Today, the Social Security Trust Fund has about $2.8 trillion, which can pay out every benefit owed to every eligible American for the next 18 years. Historically, when one of the funds, Social Security Trust Funds, has run out of money to pay 100% of promised benefits, money has been reallocated to the other fund. This is not a new idea. Over the years, it has been done in a bipartisan way with very little fanfare. It is not a big deal. In fact, this has occurred 11 times, including four times under President Ronald Reagan. And clearly, that is what we should be doing now. Now, let's be clear and understand what the Republican plan is. What they are saying is that either there will be cuts to the disability program, that's a 20% cut, if that fund is not replenished, or if the fund is replenished, that money will have to come from cuts to Social Security retirement benefits, in other words, the benefits that seniors in this country depend upon. And House Budget Chairman Tom Price is already talking about including Social Security cuts in the budget resolution that his committee will be writing. Needless to say, that is totally unacceptable to me and totally unacceptable to the American people. When we talk about Social Security today, what we should be talking about is expanding benefits, not cutting benefits. And I and members of the Senate are working on legislation to do just that. And at a time when multimillionaires pay the same amount of money into the Social Security Trust Fund as somebody making $118,000, the cap on taxable income must be raised. Let's be clear. The Social Security Disability Program is an insurance program that guarantees income to workers who become permanently disabled and co can no longer work. And virtually every American worker pays into that insurance program. Many who receive, by the way, this program, disability program, are terminally ill. Nearly 20% of all Americans who receive disability benefits die within a five-year period of being approved. Now, let me just touch on a few other issues that a serious budget will look at and that I and my colleagues on the Democratic side will look at. Today, some of the most profitable corporations and the wealthiest Americans in this country are avoiding $100 billion a year in taxes by stashing their cash in the Cayman Island, Bermuda, and other offshore 
tax havens. If we are serious about dealing with the massive problems facing our country, this is an issue that must be addressed, and certainly addressed before we talk about cutting programs for the elderly and the children. Today, as a result of the carried interest loophole, there are hedge fund managers making tens and tens of millions of dollars a year in income who pay an effective tax rate lower than a nurse or a firefighter. That has got to change. Today, we have defense contractors who produce weapon systems with multi-billion dollar cost overruns time and time again. That has got to change. Today, we have large corporations like Walmart who pay their workers so low wages that many of their workers are forced to go on government programs like Medicaid, food stamps, and affordable housing to get by. And that is why we have got to raise the minimum wage so that companies like Walmart and Burger King and McDonald's are not huge recipients of corporate welfare. So there are a lot of issues out there. Once again, I look forward uh, to working with Cham and Enzi where we have common ground. Uh, but I think there are going to be some fundamental disagreements, especially if my Republican colleagues want to be cutting Social Security. Thank you very much.